Welcome to Globus Books virtual living room and salon. My name is Irina Zabrisky. I'm a writer from San Francisco and a host and producer of Globus Books YouTube channel. Uh, today we welcome uh, Dustin Condren and I'm very excited and I'm usually very excited about our events. Uh, today uh, is something a bit different. We didn't do film yet, so I'm doubly excited. And um, we will be doing uh, not just any project by uh, Eisenstein, but unrealized and unsuccessful in a way projects. And I think Dustin will tell us more about it. For now, I will just briefly introduce uh, our guest uh, and he will introduce Sergei Eisenstein Dustin Kondran is a professor of Russian in the Department of Modern Languages, Literatures and Linguistics and affiliated faculty member in the Department of Film and Media Studies at the University of Oklahoma and a photographer. He teaches courses on Russian literature, cinema, theater and culture and is currently working on a book that explores ways of understanding films that are imagined and prepared but never made. I do this by, oh, I don't do this, but uh, Dustin <laughs> does this by analyzing a series of unrealized projects from the 1920s and 1930s by the Soviet filmmaker, Sergei Eisenstein. Dustin's photographs appeared in major domestic and international publications, including the New York Times, the Los Angeles Times, USA Today, the Washington Post, the New Yorker, Time Out, the Times London, the Guardian, uh, Dizil, Built, uh, and in online magazines elsewhere. Um, Dustin Condon's groundbreaking translation of Leo Tolstoy's The Gospel in Brief was published by HarperCollins in 2011. And um, I will very briefly introduce Globus Books for those who are new to us. We are an independent bookstore in San Francisco. We've been around for 50 years and uh, we carry mostly books on Russia, about Russia, about the former Soviet Union uh, countries, so-called post-Soviet space in Russian and in English. We also specialize in uh, antique books, vintage books, books on travels, and we carry pretty much everything that you might think of in terms of your book needs. We have children's books, culinary books, um, and we have now for the last year this wonderful YouTube channel where we bring you the speakers from all fields of literature and culture. We have literary translation roundtables, we have poetry, uh, we have authors all the way from Russia, Israel, or Europe speaking to us. So check out our schedule at www.globusbooks.com. A lot of interesting events coming. And with this, I welcome Dustin. Uh, Dustin, now to you. Thank you very much, Zarina. It's, uh, it's a big pleasure um, and a big honor to be here um, and to be included in this uh, really amazing series of speakers for Globus Books. Um, I um, especially feel excited because I've spent a lot of time in the Bay Area and it's nice to, um, including the first 10 or 11 years of my life, um, it's nice to be doing something that um, is uh, sort of connected so deeply to, to San Francisco and to the Bay Area. Um, so I am going to um, share a PowerPoint now um, that will go along with my talk. Um, the very general field of the talk today, as Zarina said, um, and generally my current um, work is broadly speaking focused on the unfinished. So as a category for understanding certain artworks, the unfinished is a complex paradigm and one that is often very dependent on the specifics of the medium in which a given conversation is taking place. In architecture, for example, the unrealized design forms an essential part of any ar archival oeuvre or conceptual portfolio. 
Um, literary, music, and art historians have developed ways of addressing the unfinished work of composers, authors, painters, sculptors, and so on. And recently, contending with the unfinished as such has become an increasingly common approach to addressing questions of process, labor, value, and so on in the work of art. This can be seen, um, for example, in the Metropolitan Museum of Art's 2016 inaugural show for the Met Breuer, which was called Unfinished Thoughts Left Visible, produced a catalog and a lot of literature around it that, that dealt with this question. Cinema specifically, of course, has been somewhat dependent upon the inclusion of unfinished projects in its larger view of the work of certain directors. As the history of cinema is littered with uh, variously failed, unrealized, incomplete, or suppressed films, but perhaps due to a persistent and fundamental gap between archival preservation and specific completist values, the unavoidably segmented processes of production, the primacy of the print and of exhibition and distribution, film history has yet to really develop a clear tradition or system for dealing with its infinity of unfinished material. And the history of Soviet film is particularly interesting in this regard. With its inordinately high numbers of such unrealized projects about which scholars such as recently Maria Belodubrovskaya have been producing very, very interesting work. So all of this brings me to Sergei Eisenstein, as Zarina mentioned, perhaps the, the most famous of all Soviet directors and certainly of his generation of Soviet film pioneers. Um, Eisenstein's fame is based primarily on the worldwide success of his landmark films, Battleship Potemkin and Ivan the Terrible, but he is also um, one of the more poignant representatives of the capriciousness of creative fate and specifically its early Soviet um, incarnation. So having experienced amid his occasionally remarkable success, an overwhelming degree of failure to realize the projects that he began. Um, among Eisenstein's unrealized projects, which by some counts number as many as 30, are works in varying degrees of development, each of which have left hugely different archival material traces. They range on one end of the spectrum uh, from films that were written, planned, and shot um, to some degree of completion, but never edited into authoritative final versions, such as Que Viva Mexico, um, to films that were developed into fully articulated screenplays, oriented toward practical production, but for various reasons never filmed, and I'll be talking about two of those today. Um, to on the other end, films that were highly developed in notes, diary entries, drawings, and script fragments, but without any fully articulated screenplay to, to speak of. And in this category, there are films um, which some of you may have heard of, such as his Glass House project from the late 20s and his attempt to um, adapt Karl Marx's capital for the screen. Um, finally, there are ideas that at some point lingered on Eisenstein's work desk, but which left very little trace of real development, really just mentions here and there. So for, for scholars studying Eisenstein, these categories of unrealized films provide discrete points of entry into Eisenstein's artistic process where the very unfinished nature of the projects makes possible the observation of a cinematic ideas coming into being, a view of its movements through, as he called them, the stages of conditioning. So um, in my work, beyond the discrete investigation of individual projects, I'm really interested in the unrealized in Eisenstein as such. And so today, what I will do is present some research that I've done on Eisenstein's own understanding of the unrealized in his own work and that of artists that he admired. Um, and then I'll take a look at two specific projects in order to illustrate the ways in which these projects offer important glimpses into the very process of cinema creation. Okay, in November 1927, when he was only 28 years old and only five years into his career as a filmmaker, Sergei Eisenstein had already begun to feel the symbolic burden of the growing number of projects that he had not been able to complete. In a diary entry from that time, amidst notes that show him considering what seems to be uh, writing a book chapter on such unrealized projects, 
He lists the major theater and film endeavors of his young career. He started as a theater director. It's important to remember. Um, he lists them in the chronological order of their undertaking. And in compiling this list, the detect director detects a strange pattern. All of the odd numbered projects of this sequence, and I'll illustrate them right now. The Mexican, which was staged in March 1921. The Wise Man, staged uh, April 1923. Are You Listening Moscow, staged November 1923. Gas Masks, staged February 1924. Strike, the film, premiered April 1925. Potemkin, premiered December 1925. And The General Line, not quite premiered yet when he was making this note, but he assumed that it would. Um, had been successfully completed. Okay, so these are the odd numbered projects of his oeuvre at this point. And he puts a plus sign next to them to indicate that they're odd numbered. Um, the interpolating even numbered projects, however, um, King Hunger, the first of these um, from 1921, Garland's Inheritance, 1923, Patatras, 1923, Trepitsin, um, an unclear date, all of these um, plays. Um, and then the film Red Cavalry and Jungo from 1924 and 1926, all of these interpolate between these successful projects and all of them are failed projects. And he puts a minus sign next to them to indicate that they are even numbered projects. They had all failed to come to fruition. And Eisenstein bestows on these unrealized works the comical but ominous epithet even numbered productions, right? Chotnia um, Pastanovki. And you can see the actual um, entry right here. So after he charts this pattern meticulously, um, in which the transition from theater to film happens also to fall in line with this odd even alternation, making strike over here, for example, um, both the first odd work of film and the ninth odd work overall. Um, the filmmaker pauses to wonder with a kind of superstitious submission to the law of numbers, which of his three currently developing projects, October, Glass House, and Capital, which of these, uh, if the pattern were to continue, should be placed in the list as odd and destined for completion, and which distributed as even and thereby doomed to incompletion. Um, so we know, of course, October, his 1928 film, um, was completed, but Glass House, uh, his, his film about a high-rise glass apartment building and the optical and political collisions of its residents in the context of total transparency, and Capital, his planned adaptation, as I mentioned, of Karl Marx's landmark study of political economy, these were never made. Um, but back to Eisenstein's almost Gnostic self-interrogation here. Um, which, even if it's half playful, I think we get the sense of that in these notes, it suggests a sort of fate-governed view of the creative process, in which not only is incompletion of projects inevitable, but also somehow necessary for the completion of the pro projects with which they alternate, right? Because without the even, there can be no odd, logic suggests. And yet it would seem that the rigidity of this essentially dialectical system still allows for the possibility of its manipulation. That Eisenstein meant to maneuver within the system he had himself outlined is demonstrated in another diary entry made almost one year later on the 12th of September, 1928, in which he records another hasty thought, um, COP, which is another project that he was developing at the time, um, will be an odd numbered work and glass house will be even. So he thinks it is not worth doing it in America where it would be not even, right? So he's preparing a trip to go to America um, and he's thinking about the possibility of filming glass house there. Um, so there's a sense of hope here and it's still, you know, as we see, highly exclamatory, three exclamation marks. And therefore we should read it, I assume, with some irony um, that a total change of geography from the USSR to the USA might have provided Eisenstein the possibility of restarting his sequence and thus changing Glass House from an even-numbered work to an odd-numbered one, the first to be done in America, for example, and therefore, by this magical thinking, possible to realize. 
Okay, so this plunge into numerology aside, Eisenstein's diary analysis of the success of his own oeuvre demonstrates the extent to which the growing corpus of incomplete works had begun to embed itself in his creative self-concept. Even at a relatively early stage, and perhaps more intriguingly, um, it shows how the gravity of these unmade films triggered the abstract functions of his imagination. At the same time, the notes betray the director's stoic sense that the complete work almost demands the experience gained in the making of the incomplete work in order to generate the momentum necessary for it to move toward its proper conclusion. This is not to suggest that Eisenstein maintained the rigid view of some thoroughgoing law of strict alternation between the complete and the incomplete, as these notes might imply if they're taking, uh, taken in total isolation, but it is to suggest that his perception of a meaningful, productive, and even dialectical relationship between the complete and the unfinished is undeniable. So the relationship is the important thing. As a specific instance, there are hints of such a belief in Eisenstein's formulation of the reciprocal relationship between two of the aforementioned projects of the late 20s, Glass House and Capital, neither of which was, as we know, to be completed. Despite that fact of his filmography, in more than one sense, the revolutionary accomplishment of intellectual cinema, as he called it, historical materialism on film, in other words, that was the anticipated end of the Capital Project was fully dependent on the discoveries to be made and the work to be accomplished in pursuit of the Glass House Project, itself ultimately intended to be a sort of way station on the path toward purely intellectual film. Um, in other words, Eisenstein makes the proper achievement of his goals in Capital contingent upon the dirty work that was to be done in his other film, Glass House, which inevitably was to include many elements of the old non-intellectual cinema. Undoubtedly, the director would have liked to have completed both films. Uh, but there is a certain sense in his notes of 27, 28, that in the case of these simultaneously pursued projects, work on the one was oriented toward the realization of technique that would make possible the creation of the other. In this treatment of the concept of the reciprocal relationship between works of the odd and even, so to speak, and in the suggestion of a quasi-mystical view of creative sequencing, one may see the seed, which is still far from full development of what would be expressed in Eisenstein's much later essay, Even and Odd, Bifurcation of the Singular. Eisenstein opens that essay with a long passage quoted from Marcel Grenet's 1932 book, La Pensée uh, Chinoise, that details the conceptual operation of the Chinese dialectic. Quote, the odd contains within itself and separates out from itself the even, which is merely the external two-sided, right and left, yin and yang, manifestation of the odd. The passage here ultimately demonstrates the coexistence and interdependence of these two figures, odd and even, and suggests that what separates the one from the other is a question not of numerical quantity, but of internal quality. This is also what unites each manifestation of the odd with all others, and likewise each even with every other manifestation of its kind. So following this long passage, Eisenstein writes, is it not the case that this sounds like some kind of strange half mystical raving? And at the same time, somewhere and somehow, I would say somewhere other than consciousness, you feel some sort of rightness in these assertions. Somewhere not in the brain, but in the region of the tendons, you feel that somewhere in the dynamism of these concepts, there is something real. These last of Eisenstein's observations here on the Chinese sequential system could just as easily, easily have been written about the sequential system he proposes for his own creative biography above. Though it may sound like a sort of strange, half mystical raving, one senses something truly operative in the conceptual dynamic of his odd and even um, conceptualization of uh, unfinished and finished. From a position of historical distance, these observations on the dialectical power of the even and odd sequence cannot help but highlight the tragic naivete of the young Eisenstein, writing, as we saw in 1927, in regard to his future endeavors in filmmaking. How was he to know, after all, that this steady pattern of completion and incompletion would break very soon, in which direction it would break, and with what dramatic force 
How different his interpretation of the pattern might have been had he known that every single feature film project he would undertake in the decade between 1929 and 1938, between the compromised completion of the general line and the release of Alexander Nevsky, would remain incomplete and mostly unseen. So an entire decade's worth of work, um, which could be considered um, total failure. Already by 1933, in recognition of his 10 year anniversary working in cinema and having experienced a series of immense creative disappointments in a two year sojourn, and I'll talk about this later, in Europe, Hollywood, and Mexico, along with some false starts on his, in his first year back in the Soviet Union, the director took up the task of editing for publication the screenplays from these unmade projects in the hopes of demonstrating the quality of some of the work that he had been doing over the past years. And though this publication itself never came to fruition and thereby multiplying the layers of unrealization, Eisenstein did succeed in preparing the draft of a preface for the collection, published in a 1992 issue of Iskustva Kino as toward a preface for the unfinished pieces. Um, in its task of introducing the film scripts to the reading public, the essay also demonstrates Eisenstein's fascinating attitude toward his extending corpus of unfinished work and its general relevance for his artistic legacy. In the essay, after ruefully describing some of these failed projects he had tried to make in the West, he builds to a quotation from the 19th century Austrian writer Franz Grillparzer. I'm sure most people do not know. Um, ich möchte eine Tragödie in Gedanken schreiben, uh, schreiben können. Es würde ein Meisterwerk werden. Right? Um, I would like to write a tragedy in thoughts. It would be a masterpiece. So this fantasy of being able to, to write something that stays strictly in your brain and that that's the thing that would be the masterpiece. The possibility of just such an immaterial masterpiece is compelling for Eisenstein, who writes, alas, such a fate has befallen the second five-year period of my creative work. To what extent the compositions of this period are masterpieces, I do not know but that they remained in the mind, unfortunately, is a fact. Eisenstein then goes on to make a list of eight substantial unrealized projects to which Grillparzer's concept of the unmade masterpiece might apply. He lists them as follows. One, Glass House, which we mentioned. Two, Sutter's Gold, which I'll talk about in a moment. Three, another film um, on the magnate Basil Zakharov. Four, a film about the Haitian Revolution five, an adaptation of uh, Theodore Dreiser's American Tragedy, six, Que Viva Mexico, seven, a comedy called MMM, which I will talk about shortly, and eight, a film about the 800th anniversary of Moscow, the capital. Um, so the projects that he enumerates here span the seven years between 1926 and 1933, and each represents an instance of Eisenstein's concerted passion and sustained labor devoted toward the eventual emergence of a full cinema texts. Though each fell short of the screen, they yielded varying amounts of pre-cinematic material, from the brief but pointed initial notes for the Haitian film, to the dozens of pages of notes and drawings for Glass House, to the full screenplays and director's plans for Sutter's Gold and American Tragedy, to the tens of thousands of meters of unedited footage for Que Viva Mexico. Um, perhaps more compelling than this list is Eisenstein's assessment of the labor he devoted to those works. This is what really gets me interested. In this series of unsuccessful projects, I experienced all the delights and voluptuous tremblings of the creative process, but alas, with one minor nuisance. Telepathy is still not a universally available instrument of knowledge, and therefore this opus is fated to remain kept tightly to myself. So he experienced these works as though they had been the full version of the creative process. In other words, to him, there is no difference between complete and incomplete in the actual process of creation. Eisenstein's interiority features as the sole projection space for these works. Uh, his thoughts prove an unreliable medium for their transmission and his continuing cinematic muteness guarantees their unrealized status and yet, he asserts that much within these eight projects came very close to completion, almost full circle in fact, and that as creatively fully developed pieces, the projects bring with them undoubtable experience. 
here again is an assertion of the productive artistic value of the unfinished work and not just for its inscription into a subsequent completed project but more for the sophistication and expansion of the filmmaker's aesthetic machinery generally this premise that the indisputable value of the unfinished work lies in the power of its potential energy as both expansion of experience and refinement of process is expressed somewhat differently in the essay's uh, opening pages too when Eisenstein makes an elaborate self-correlation with Leonardo da Vinci. The bond that he feels with Leonardo was one that he considered to be deep and fateful and the very thing that led him into the world of art in the first place. Ironically, the same quality in Leonardo had the power to occasionally lead him out of that same world. Senor Leonardo sits for a month at a time in front of the sketched lines of the fresco we read somewhere. This is not laziness. It is not the deadliness of slow tempos. It is curiosity. The ever persistent curiosity of little boys who were willing to sacrifice the functioning of a clock in the name of uncovering the secret of that function. There is no sweeter poison and none more disastrous for creation. For this secret, you must pay a bloody price. For years, your picture, your film will not get off the ground. All around, there will be smiles and the shrugging of shoulders, but the curiosity drills deeper and deeper into the depths, into the mastery of the principle. And here, I should reiterate, the curiosity, he frames it as the curiosity to peer inside the process of creation. The image of the incomplete work here changes slightly. The question as to why the work is left unfinished has moved from the assumption of some sort of external cause more urgent demands from other projects, financial unviability, studio disapproval, governmental censorship, etc., now to a strictly internal one. The emphasis is now on the fascination with process and peering into it, with the theorization of principles, with the constant refinement, elaboration, and complication of the work toward its end rather than the end itself. And this might be taken to an extreme, indeed, to prolong the pleasure of the process one may even wish to avoid the end. Eisenstein himself provides the sexual metaphor here to close the loop encircling the figures of process, completion, and creation. The da Vincian shamelessness of curiosity, he calls it, um, about the artistic process is a sidelong glance into the bedroom of creativity at the very moment of the quote, holy act. Although this metaphor operates rhetorically both as a perverse confession and as an unimpeachable justification, he is guilty, true, of losing himself in the process. But after all, this was the affliction of the greatest artists of the Renaissance as well. It is the same fault that the director was so emphatically publicly accused of in 1935 at the All Union Creative Conference of Soviet film workers, famously. Um, when directors such as Sergei Vasilyev and Alexander Davzhenko um, exclaimed that Eisenstein, this is Davzhenko speaking, knows so much and has such a clear mind that he apparently will never make another film again. What troubled Eisenstein's colleagues in the Soviet filmmaking establishment were what they saw as the incompatibility of the theoretical and the practical in his work. Eisenstein's response to all of this was, of course, to defend the importance of yoking together theory and practice. That he believed the work should be conducted parallel to a similarly intense theoretical work and theoretical research. So for Eisenstein, the strain between theory and practice need not, as his critics surmised, be the cause for his protracted incapability of completing a project, but rather was to be seen as a necessary condition for the creative engine propelling the forward motion of his activity. The thought that this tension may work as a sort of creative dialectic in which the discoveries and complications of the one can be tested, accepted, or even rejected by the practical implementations of the other becomes a compelling model for a practice of cinema in which both the academic and the actual are given equal priority. The da Vincian danger then of peering inside the process thus only results in stagnation when such peering is indulged at the expense of its productive counterpart, praxis. In other words, cases in which, as Eisenstein would, would later write, having worked out the principle, I lose interest in its application. And this was definitely the case with some of the projects that we've mentioned. <clears throat> 
If one takes Eisenstein at his word, counting the unrealized work to be on the same level as the fully realized, the value of continued research into his unfinished works becomes, of course, self-evident, especially when attempting to trace the development of his creative process and aesthetic tendencies over the period between the divergent cinematic phenomena of Potemkin and Ivan. Not only does his extended period of incompletion trace the sejura between these periods, but it also carries within it the theme of their inextricable connection. This is especially true if we are interested in focusing or protracting our sidelong glance into the bedroom of Eisenstein's creativity. In his late incomplete theoretical text entitled Method, Eisenstein writes of Van Gogh's brushstroke as providing a marvelous sense of the coming into being of forms. The brushstroke itself, he writes, is a quote, peculiar residue within the work itself of the creator's own gestural motion, an idiosyncratic, dynamic self-portrait of the artist's gesticulation, as accurate as any literal self-portrait. These observations precede a brief analysis of the convergence of diffuseness and definition in the writing of James Joyce and in the sculptural works of both Michelangelo and Rodin. According to Eisenstein, Michelangelo's works are a pure revelation, especially those works in which the trace of the chisel's path is left behind deliberately on the surface as it gives birth to these living forms from out of the stillness of stone nothingness. And here he compares the unfinished textural quality of Michelangelo, a quality that was the product of historical necessity. His works were left unfinished because of the sort of details of his own biography and the stylistic choice of Rodin to leave the trace of the chisel in the work intentionally. He, includes that the, he concludes that the partially finished final form of both sculptors is key to the work's aesthetic power. Um, and I quote here, however, the effect, if different in force, is undoubtedly identical in nature. And the crushing sensual strength of Michelangelo's incomplete statues of the slaves from the gardens of Boboli who rise up out of the stone, just as the first people traditionally arose from the dust, or the gently lyrical beings of Rodin, airy like a fleeting pulsation by which the vivified stone seems to thaw. These are, both in equal measure, the stone image of the transition from the diffuse and undefined into the differentiated and defined. So this thought, which I'm gonna sort of end this section of my talk on, this thought then points us back to Eisenstein's finished and unfinished work that the consideration of the unfinished pieces can provide the effect of viewing within a work the crucial moment of its own coming into being, the creation of form from diffuseness, the tension between that which is complete, fully formed, and that which is still in potentia, undefined. Okay, so now um, I'm gonna move to talking about two projects that I think help uh, to sort of bring some of these ideas uh, into a little bit more sharp focus. Um, so let's jump in space and time uh, to an actual instance of the unfinished, to the summer of 1930, to the north end of Beverly Hills, California, to Eisenstein's temporary home in the Coldwater Canyon neighborhood, um, as of that spring, while he was still in France, the director had signed a contract with Paramount Pictures, who were eager to have the famous Russian director develop and shoot a film with access to all the immense resources of their studio, pending, of course, executive script approval. So Eisenstein, his assistant Grigory Alexandrov, pictured here with him, and their camera operator Edward Tisse, all left the USSR in August of the previous year, under official commission to study filmmaking practices in Europe and the United States, with an eye especially toward the use of the nascent sound recording and synchronizing technologies that were now being introduced. And this is important to what I'll be talking about. Um, by the time they had crossed the Atlantic and the North American continent to settle in California, it had become clear that they had one project that was the most um, viable of all the others. And this would be an adaptation of the um, novel by the French modernist Blaise Sandrard, uh, titled L'Or, or Gold, the content of which was the colossal tale of Swiss American settler Johann Sutter, his colonization and settling of Northern California, briefly known as New Helvetia, the California gold rush that originated on his land, uh, his incipient destitution resulting from the unstemmable tide of population that overran his territory during the gold rush, uh, 
and the total ruination of, of the primordial American landscape by unbridled mass money lust. So a perfect project for a sort of um, uh, a sort of uh, Marxist with a with a with a desire to make a sort of big picture in, in, with uh, Hollywood resources. So this is Eisenstein's first true literary adaptation and the first of two full literary adaptations that he and his collaborators produced in this fertile Hollywood summer. The other, the screened version of Dreiser's American Tragedy. Both films, tragically, as we know, never produced. And in the case of Sutter's Gold, following the work that I'll be describing here momentarily, um, Paramount simply informed Eisenstein and his team that the pr proposed film would just be too expensive, an obvious excuse, and that they should move on to a different project, which they did. Um, and that's fine, because what we're interested in um, all comes before that moment. So Eisenstein probably became acquainted with the work of Sandrar during his early 1930s stay in Paris, and even had the opportunity to breakfast with Sandrar and discuss their mutual work. Um, this is another shot of the Coldwater Canyon. Um, this is Blaise Sandrar. Um, whether or not Sandrar and Eisenstein in their meeting broached the topic of actually adapting the novel um, is less clear. But knowing that what um, Paramount most wanted from him was a literary adaptation, Eisenstein quickly read Sandrar's novel around this time. He then took Lohr with him as he left Paris for America and began adapting it in July. And we can assume that the polyglot Eisenstein would have read the novel in the original French, though interestingly it had been translated and published in 1926 into both Russian and English, which you can see here. There is a sense that Lohr is particularly well suited to a second life in cinema, and that this may have facilitated Eisenstein's comfort in selecting it as source material. The prose is compact, focused on the senses, episodic, and the descriptive paragraphs are short and the dialogue is terse, and there is a hint of cinematic montage in the arrangement of scenes. And this quality of Sandrar's writing has been commented on by scholars such as Christopher Frayling, who in his book Spaghetti Westerns, um, writes that um, Sandrar's style is an attempt to seize the world at the unusual angles of a cinema camera. And this is an observation of sort of intermedia transaction um, uh, that is not groundless since uh, Sandrar himself, after establishing himself as a poet in the early decades of the century, wound up working in cinema, including um, assisting Abel Gantz on two of his most famous films, Jacques and La Rue, um, and this is a collaboration that has led some sort of, um, I would say, overzealous Sandrar scholars to speculate as to the influence of Sandrar's poetry and prose on Gans's fast cutting techniques, which in turn influenced Eisenstein's Patyomkin. So despite this hyperbolic sort of backward, shaky cinematic influence that somehow charts to Eisenstein, the grounding here of the inherently cinematic quality of Sandrar's literary style is what interests us. Um, so. Not only was this his first full literary adaptation, it was also um, his first attempt at generating a feature length sound film. And that, that's uh, a hugely um, interesting um, point to be starting from. We should remember that this is 1930. Um, there hadn't been any sound films made in the Soviet Union to this point, and only a few um, in Europe and in the United States. So what is perhaps most immediately obvious in comparing the final screenplay uh, to the novel is the enormous care and even ingenuity applied to the orchestration and manipulation of detailed sounds and songs, uh, vocal expressions, extra diegetic music, which is to say music that doesn't exist within the reality of the film, and also of narrative voice. And from the available documents, it seems that Eisenstein's infusion of audio into the concept of the Sutter's Gold film was a gradual process where we can see the steady accumulation of energy needed to make the script consolidate around the possibilities of new sound technology. Um, so there's an 18 page treatment um, that precedes the screenplay itself. And in it, there's a sort of hint of Eisenstein's intention to, to play with the uh, sound. But for the most part, it's just camera setups, which echoes exactly Sandrar's novel. Um, but after he wrote this treatment, Eisenstein and his crew um, took a very uh, sort of sudden quick trip to Northern California. Um, they went to San Francisco and Sacramento to perform a few days of historical and ethnographic research. So one of the reasons I decided to talk about this project is just because 
Northern California Globus books, it seemed to make sense. Um, so here's a picture of Eisenstein um, near the uh, farm of, of Sutter, um, not far from Coloma, just over 100 miles east of Globus Books. Inevitably, um, this trip had the effect of preparing the filmmakers to write a screenplay that both, or that more materially corresponded to both, sorry, to both uh, the reality and the legend of the 1848 discovery of gold on uh, John Sutter's estate as the drawings that Eisenstein produced during and afterward, um, such as we have here Sutter's Fort and a view of Monterey Bay and so on. These drawings can attest to that sort of material sort of reality that had inspired the director. Um, one significant development occurred during this brief journey that would have a profound effect on the writing of the full screenplay and indeed on his full filmmaking practice going forward. In his much later 1946 essay, The Springs of Happiness, Eisenstein recalls having learned the obvious, quote, obvious tangibility of the technique of musical counterpoint from literature, from James Joyce particularly. Um, in that essay, he writes in a sort of mythical tone, I came to know the structure of leitmotif and counterpoint among the bases of even greater trees, the famous redwoods around San Francisco. I rested for a week in their cool shade, far from the heat and commotion of Hollywood. I gnawed the sweet fruits of knowledge and drank the subtle poison of Joyce's Ulysses. So here with the actual world of Sutter's gold physically in front of him and the restless auditory environment of the film setting in his ears, the director was able to understand, thanks to his reading of Joyce, the obvious tangibility of the soundtrack and its montage potential. So with a new Joycey and vigor for counterpoint and leitmotif, Eisenstein and his group returned to Hollywood and set to writing out the full script. Now dense with sound cues and intricate barbed audiovisual orchestrations and produced for the studio a full finished draft of 56 pages in just three days of writing. A thick text sub subsequently filled out, filled out by series of Eisenstein's drawings and sketches um, much of which now exists in the Russian State Archive of Literature and Art or the Eisenstein Archive at New York City's MoMA. This fully articulated script is written in short quasi um, stanzaic paragraphs, most just one or two lines on the page, and each paragraph presenting a new sound or image to be recorded, shot, um, or perceived. And here's an example page from the script. Among the many audio-visual audio techniques that Eisenstein innovates in these pages are what he calls leitmotif. So this is audio treated for its musical and tonal qualities, employed with some degree of complexity over multiple instances, sonic signatures that reappear throughout the film associated with Sutter or other characters, this most dominantly in what he called the Song of California that starts the film. This recurring theme comes to stand for the main character himself, but also enhances and expands him the mysterious Swiss pioneer. Um, so the song's lyrical content acts as a pendant to Sutter's screen journey toward and through the American landscape and into its mythology. Um, we also have here the phenomenon in which sound initially created within the real fabric of the film, say bells or the sound of fire, um, are given a, sort of a recurrence later on in which their value becomes symbolic rather than real as a psychological projection of Sutter. And this leads to the second really interesting phenomenon of, of audio that Eisenstein developed while working on this script. Um, and that's what he called symphonies. And these are overtly described orchestral or symphonic movements that organize and amplify existing elements of the soundtrack. So there are several in instances of what Eisenstein called orchestral sound montage, and those that he embeds in the screenplay are oriented toward a specifically traumatic brand of sound, um, like a leitmotif, but with far greater magnitude. Um, they were employed to demonstrate the subjective psychological experience of the main character and operated here in tandem with the film's overriding theme, the destruction of nature by the unbridled surge of capitalism. A prime one of these comes at the height of the gold rush in the fourth reel of the film screenplay as prospectors spill onto Sutter's lands in California. The soundtrack gradually builds up a medley of pickaxes, water moving through sluices, panning, scraping, the tearing of the land, which all merges into a symphony of the working of the mines, 
overwhelming the visual plane of the film as the sounds pervade the whole land. Sutter moves through this landscape listening to the cacophony, which is punctuated deep in the sound mix by an echoing disembodied ring of the word gold, 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 gold. The audio then mutates into a symphony of new sounds with thousands of feet trampling upon the stones, the beat of axes, the voices of an endless human stream, felling trees, whistling of saws, pigs in slaughter, where, quote, colossal are the sounds of the mob that are giving his land to, the dis to destruction, end quote. We hear all of this, and this to me is the, is the interesting part. We hear all of this, but we only see Sutter sitting still, dumbstruck, reduced to viewing this destruction, maddened by these sounds. So this more or less impassive face against a soundtrack full of expressive sounds is in fact a first attempt at the technique, a milestone device actually in literary adaptation that Eisenstein would shortly use to produce the hero's interior monologue in his American tragedy script. Blank face dialogue on the soundtrack that sort of emulate or that gives thought to the, the hero's face um, in a much more complex way than that in American tragedy. But this is the clear fruit of the revelation that came through his reading of Ulysses while sitting under the redwoods in Northern California. And while Sutter's goal does not generally aspire to the complexity and depiction of its hero's inner life, as American tragedy does, um, it does put the technique in potent use as it recurs in the final scene of the film, The Climactic Death of Sutter, where he hears a rush of sound cues that serve as audio tags to connect imminent death to the avalanche of prospectors invading his land. Um, in the soundtrack, uh, Eisenstein writes, every sound is shrill, every note is piercing. And all of this against his face, aroused with an expression of triumph. The supreme crescendo of this symphony synchronizes with the final shuddering of his old body. All of the multifarious sound that is filled and then suddenly been drained from the soundtrack has become symbolic sound, detached from its organic phenomenal value and given a subjective psychological charge. Okay, so I'm gonna stop there with, um, with Sutter's Gold. Um, and in the few minutes left that I wanna take, I'm gonna move very quickly to uh, one more film project, um, which is uh, a film that Eisenstein worked on for about a year. Um, after he returned to um, Moscow, after his disappointing time in North America and, um, and Mexico. Um, not very much has really ever been written about this film, and so it's something that I've been spending a lot of time on lately. Um, the film is called MMN. Um, and some of what is interesting to me about it addresses the same questions of sound and interiority that I just discussed in Sutter's Gold. But the big question here in this film for Eisenstein is comedy, how to make a Soviet comedy, um, and how to use what he understood as the fundamentally dynamic movement of comedy um, to transform his cinema values into that context. Um, Eisenstein uh, barely ever mentions this film in his own theoretical writing, and this is weird because he always talks about his own work um, in his writing. Um, there is just one scant mention in a, in a um, 1935 essay called Bolsheviks Do Laugh, in which um, he says, several years ago I was working on the screenplay for a comedy. So this light reminiscence is then followed by some thoughts on his general tendency to become so obsessed with research, as I mentioned earlier, that principles begin to take precedence over their creative manipulation and application. And he concludes um, that perhaps he was not destined to make a Soviet comedy. So he sort of implies here that uh, his commitment to the comedy was scant and that it was really just a passing means towards theoretical thought on comedy. Um, and indeed from a distance, this film does seem to sort of mystify. Uh, it seems to be a sort of tardy attempt at a NEP style uh, Soviet social satire. Its title is totally unintelligible. What does MMM mean? Um, and Eisenstein's sudden discarding of it in the spring of 1933 makes it seem as though it was never really so important to him. And yet the archive, th thank God for the archive, the archive tells us a very different story. Um, in the MMM file in the Russian State Archive of Art and Literature, there's a shocking amount of material. Uh, two different screenplay treatments, six drafts of a full literary scenario, 
um, four drafts of a director's script, multiple edit lists, extensive handwritten notes, a large collection of the director's drawings for characters, costumes, sets, all of it totaling well over 2,000 pages that document the development of an idea and its movement toward execution. So as I've argued recently, far from being a footnote to the work of the renowned filmmaker, it actually represents some of the most compellingly imaginative, formally experimental, and ideologically risky work he ever produced. Um, so the film begins, we're introduced to Maxim Maximovich Maxim, and in this sort of silly repetition of this character's name, we come to understand the meaning of the title. Um, he is an upwardly mobile, obsequious, and shape-shifting bureaucrat of inflated responsibility, the director of a local intourist office. Um, and the plot begins after a busy night uh, at Intourist, spent celebrating the arrival of a mute foreign guest with the preposterous name Kanit Verstan. Maxim is seen stumbling through the city, very drunk, eventually finding himself inside a church. And there, full of, quote, misplaced enthusiasm, he looks around at the ancient wall paintings and icons, raising an insolent pseudo-revolutionary fist up toward them, and then things get interesting as, quote, by candlelight, he repeats Don Juan's challenge to the statue of the Commodore, calling upon all of ancient Rus, and he challenges them to come down from their cathedral walls and join the local profsayus, or the laborers union, and make use of themselves. And after a pause uh, in an uncanny, if maybe somewhat predictable uh, response, one of these frescoes slowly bends its head and nods to accept Maxim Maximovich's challenge. I will come down, it says. So our hero bolts home immediately, terrified, no doubt, that like Don Juan, he would be pursued and dragged down to hell by this likeness that he's been taunting. But Max makes it home safely to his wife and to his room. But imagine his surprise then when he is woken from his sleep next morning by the arrival of a large delegation of figures from ancient Rus, now having truly descended from their church frescoes and crowded into his small Moscow apartment. Um, there's an Orthodox patriarch, some boyars, various bogatirs, a palach, uh, a falconer, goosely players, and so on. These visitors quickly transform his bedroom into a rollicking medieval banquet hall, and a series of comic hijinks ensues, eventually dissipating in a camera dissolve to Maxime's face buried in the bedsheets. It has all been a dream. He wakes up again in relief, but this entire manic prologue that sets up the rest of the film moves swiftly from a rewriting of this Pushkinian Don Juan tragic form in its setup um, the swaggering challenge issued to a static image, um, to a Gagolian grotesque in the outrageous cast of characters, vaguely reminiscent, I would say, of a Vasnitsov painting, who all show up at Max's bedside and magically transform his marital bed into a troika that gallops through the window and into the snowy expanses of the Russian countryside, a la the finale of Dead Souls. But the film's major trick, as Eisenstein saw it, um, would occur in the first act proper when Maxim returns to his interest office um, after this wild night and his dream, only to find that his waiting room is full of the same boyars, bogatirs, and patriarch. It turns out that while the medieval visitors had been gallivanting in Maxim's dreams, the um, Committee for Communal Farming had demolished the church into which they had long ago been painted in order to make room for a kalhoz market, leaving ancient Rus nowhere else to turn for shelter but in Turist. So this sort of fundamental joke of the film um, is the, the real problem for Maxime. What does this mean for his professional hospitality? It is, after all, his duty to host the foreign visitors as the director of Inturist. Should he welcome them? If so, how? Um, and this is really MMM Zany sort of premise. Um, it all plays out in an extended series of incongruities as the plot progresses. Um, the outsized Ilya Muramets and two of his Bogatir companions squeezing into and then eventually bursting a Moscow streetcar, a political re-education prison liberated by two mythological birds of paradise, Syrian and Alkanost, uh, 
and an attempt by the Palach to perform an execution at the Lobnaya Miesta, which is now crowded with tourists and so on in Red Square. So what's amazing about MMM? A lot of things. Um, its form, uh, for one thing, it's written entirely in verse, which is totally bizarre for a screenplay. Um, two, it, has, it sort of has an introduction of Vidinia at the very beginning of it, in which uh, Eisenstein explains the ideological contents of the, of the screenplay, um, and also includes an explanatory note as to how the film should be understood. Um, also, it's sort of written in the form of a nibolitsa, uh, like a sort of tall tale. Um, and it does a lot of work in that, in that context, uh, moving between questions of reality and dream. Um, at a certain point, the, um, the narrator, um, in response to Max's question, is this reality or is it a dream? The narration comes in and says, ni to ni drugoya, so it's not one or the other. Sort of complicated um, uh, sort of existential issue for, for the character. But what I find most remarkable remarkable about the film is the line between the reality of the film and the reality of filmmaking. So there are repeated formal references to the elements of filmmaking. The camera, the microphone, and the film crew are all meant to appear on screen at different points um, in, the, in the movie. The many dream sequences that the film employs and its discourse about reality and dream combine with these metacinematic moments to suggest that what Eisenstein wanted audiences to see in MMM more than anything else was a film. In fact, even the material in motion of celluloid itself is implicated in the film's script. As it passes through the camera's chamber at certain moments, the film frame is meant to freeze and in others it's meant to run backwards. Perhaps the most notable instance of metacinematic play is that Eisenstein, the filmmaker, the author of the scenario and the director of the film, is to appear bodily in the script at key moments, commenting on the action. In fact, Eisenstein makes the compelling choice uh, to list himself as the first member of the dramatis personae, the Diesfusche Litza, included at the beginning of the script, where he is referred to as the writer and director Sergei Eisenstein. At first, this de detail just seems to be a mistake, that the filmmaker had maybe meant to leave his name above the traditional line between cast and creative team, but each draft bears the specific order out. In fact, more than one of the drafts even lists the first two characters, the first two roles of the film, author and director, as separately numbered characters, each to be played by an actor called Sergei Eisenstein. So far from being a, a mere flourish of auteurism, this is a casting decision that will be literally fulfilled for the first time at the culmination of the script's first act. The plot at this point um, has reached an impasse between its medieval characters and the contemporary citizens of Moscow, they all stand on the floor of a factory and the narrator observes how like chess pieces they are. And with that, another transformation takes place. Uh, as a group, they realize the metaphor and become a literal chessboard and its relevant pieces, their social and erotic alignments being worked out as moves within a game. And just as the reader of this very bizarre script wonders who it is performing the moves of this now tangible narrative game, the author himself appears. Um, and above the board, Eisenstein plays against himself at chess. So Eisenstein, or the, or the version of himself that he's written in the script, then turns to the audience and laments the dramatic impasse and the seeming impossibility of its resolution. He wonders how to write himself out of this mess. And we are reminded that the basic tension here is between the two Eisensteins, between the writer and the director, between the one imagining the story in unbounded text and the other burdened with the task of somehow incarnating it in the material world. A self-conscious contest between the literary and the cinematic. And it's not just a device for the screenplay itself since the shooting script, also in the archive, calls for a literal camera setup in, quote, the office of the director and screenwriter, in which a chess table has been set up and at which, quote, on either side sit the author and the director pondering in torment the further moves of the game. And uh, alongside that, we have this drawing that Eisenstein made of himself. And if you know uh, what Eisenstein looks like, these are pretty good, um, sort of slightly different versions of himself. After y regisseur. So this doubly articulated appearance of Eisenstein within the action of his own film is followed somewhat later by another particularly meaningful, if grotesque, instance of metacinematic play. And this is the last instance that I'll work on here. 
this is a, a place where we can see a clear connection to and leap from the audio concerns of Sutter's Gold, which he had been working on just two years earlier in Hollywood. Maxime, the main character, caught between his loyalty to the standards of Soviet Moscow and his bourgeois desire to play the consummate interiorist host to the medieval Rus, suddenly becomes dumbfounded, almost feverish in his indecision of how to act. He begins to drool and gasp for air, and his lips grow pale. And suddenly, by mistake, he snatches in his lips the microphone and swallows it along with his drool and all around goes silent. If there's no more microphone, there's no recording of sound. So we go with miming into a silent film. So Maxim's physical dilemma is so acute here that he or the actor playing him loses command of his body to such an extent that he steps beyond the realm of the film's reality and inadvertently interrupts the apparatus of the film's very production. The extreme language of the bodily, his pale lips, his fever, his drool, stands starkly against the mechanical object of production that it consumes. But this is more than just a momentary rupture of the illusion of filmic totality. By muting the outside world, carnalizing the still complicated silent sound dichotomy, and directing the process of sound recording to the inside of Max's body, Eisenstein is able to provide a new imaginative presentation apparatus that can realize the metaphor couched in the term inner struggle or inner monologue. The audience is given the ability to both see and hear what is going on within the body of the film's hero. I'm sorry for this text if it's hard to read. Um, and suddenly shooting fire and din, the director and the mixer fly in from their booths. Well, what's going on here? A title card, what's going on? Turns out the microphone has been swallowed and the transmission of external events has now turned inward to Maxime into his soul. Again, we have director Eisenstein staging his own confusion in concert now with that of his sound mixer and the incongruity of the shocking sounds of battle against the mute perplexity of these two cinema practitioners shatters the seamless illusion of sound and vision by separating one from the other. And it forces the film again to use a title card something meant to be growing archaic at this point in order to pose the filmmaker, filmmaker's question for them, what's going on. Here the director's shooting script calls for the scene to be filmed at quote, the border of the office hallway and the film set. And it is across this liminal boundary that an x-ray machine is wheeled in uh, and the director and the sound mixer come running to fetch the microphone. The confusion in the studio is eased by the x-ray performed on Max's body which adds then an internal vision to the inner struggle. It makes the hero's form schematic, contingent, and the boundaries of his body become an additional shooting space for the film. So all of these overt meta processes that Eisenstein deploys uh, suggest an unexpected continuation, as we were talking about earlier, of the interior monologue that he had developed as a technique first in Sutter's Gold and then in an American tragedy. There it was the sort of highly dramatic, almost epic level um, confrontation between the stoic face and the broad soundscape that demonstrates the psychological state of Johann Sutter. And here it's in the comedic form, right? For Eisenstein, comedy was the form of the dialectic but drained of its content. Uh, the dialectic without its revolutionary dynamism, right? So form made uh, sort of empty. And what we get here is the form of the inter interior monologue with strictly bourgeois content, right? um, Max's feelings about how to do his job best. Um, moreover, we have Eisenstein's own interior monologue as the film's creator, which makes the audience privy to his concerns with the mechanics of filmmaking, his awareness of cinema theoretical discourses as they were at the time, and his anticipation of his likely detractors the tenuousness of the script's political signification. Ultimately, all of this of narrative imagination hemmed in by ideological concerns. Ironically, all of these things to different degrees ultimately leading to his eventual abandonment of the project. So quickly, in conclusion then, um, the historical biographical reasons for the incompletion of these films may be interesting. But the document-based version of cinema that Eisenstein presents in these nearly forgotten film materials reminds us of the cinema creative process in which the execution of one stage 
is entirely contingent upon its transformation as it moves to, to a subsequent stage. We deal with the dialectic in which the ideal of the completed film is always contending with its necessarily incomplete preparatory materials. And the preparatory materials constantly produce an idiosyncratic set of qualities meant merely to fade as they develop. Uh, a script in verse, for example, that could never exist anywhere but on paper. Finally, what can be said here for the completion of a cinema of archival, for the conception of a cinema of archival documents? The swarm, as Eisenstein called it, uh, written in graphic material. It returns us to his own peculiar articulation of the odd and the even. When he writes in method of, uh, of the odd and the even, as we saw earlier, it is an entree into Eastern modes of dialectical thinking, the bifurcation of the singular, yin and yang, each part containing and determining the other. In a section of his memoirs, also with the provisional title, The Bifurcation of the Singular, Eisenstein returns to the idea of division as a primary figure in Judeo-Christian cosmogony as well. That Jehovah divided the lightness from the darkness, the water from the dry land, Eve from out of Adam. The articulation of form in this instance becomes the most basic figure of creation, in which diffuseness and form exist simultaneously at the moment in which they are divided, an instance of pure creative energy. The incomplete works then, counted on the same level as the complete ones, existing simultaneous to them and in dialectical relationship with them, their necessary counterpart become cinematic objects unto themselves, figures of a durational creative process of an idea caught exactly between the diffuse and the defined. Thank you, Dustin. That was mind blowing. I'm speechless. I had a couple of questions prepared, but um, uh, actually, especially MMM part completely blew me off my chosen path, and I forgot what I was going to ask before. Uh, and uh, I, I guess I'm just going to share what, what came to mind as I was listening, starting from the end. Yeah, please. Uh, because, you know, for once, you know, for those who are familiar with uh, uh, Eisenstein, it's mostly all very serious, so you do not expect the comedy element, although there is an element of circus, especially in his theater career, he loved yeah. circus, so there are some funny, funky moves, but nothing <laughs> as hilarious as this one. Uh, actually, MMM brought to mind for uh, Russian-speaking audience and for those who grew up in the Soviet Union, uh, uh, definitely would be familiar with the classic uh, Soviet comedy, Ivan Vasilievich is changing his profession, mm -hmm. uh, which is based on Bulgakov script and okay. which has a lot of parallels. I don't know if you, 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 you would agree, right? Yeah. Uh, again, for those, for our English speaking audience, um, it's a, a pretty simple story, very similar to Maxim, Maximovich Maxim uh, fate, where uh, two scoundrels uh, somehow accidentally dissolve or diffuse their, um, with the help of a scientist, actually, the wall of an apartment, and they fall through into Ivan the Terrible's uh, era, which, of course, you know, then Ivan the Terrible. I wonder if Bulgakov had Eisenstein in mind or somehow knew about this project. And then th there's the whole adventure where we see all, all of these uh, ancient R Russia characters uh, streaming into the modern life and vice versa. So what do you think? Do you think there's a connection? Well, you know, it's, it's, I think it's a very compelling question. Um, I think that there's no direct connection um, because I believe Bulgakov's play is from 1935 or 1936. Um, I, I could be wrong on the exact date, which means A, it predates Ivan the Terrible for Eisenstein. So the connection there, I'll come back to in a second, but um, I have tried to find any sort of trace of a mention of Bulgakov and Eisenstein together in the same sentence even considering their, um, their uh, closeness to the theater world um, and to, you know, say, the Moscow Art Theater and, and Stanislavski and so on. Um, 
I can't find anything. And I, and I, what I, what I would really think is that the 1930s produced a certain kind of imagina imagination in which, you know, what we would call like the Aesopian um, sort of fable based um, way of writing wound up being a, a very productive form. Um, so it could be possible that in order to pursue each of them, pursue the, their very specific ideas, they both thought, well, uh, you know, maybe uh, it would make sense for us to sort of create some sort of uh, conflict of generations or of, of eras between medieval Rus and, um, and contemporary Moscow. But yeah, the similarities, similarities are huge. One thing that I, that I can say is that in his preparation for writing MMM, this that he um, went to the theater in Moscow quite a bit, having just returned from, from the US and Mexico, right? So he, he was going to the theater all the time and he kept a, a journal, and this is in his archive, of um, the sort of the playbills that were up at the time. And he certainly, you know, he has, there's one document in which he circles every single play that was being staged at the time that had to do with medieval Russia. And there were a lot of them, right? And this was in 1932. So I think that it was just sort of in the air. It was a very sort of like popular context in which to, to, um, uh, to sort of channel one's energy when creating original work that dealt with contemporary events and contemporary um, ideas was dangerous. Much easier to just sort of choose either something written 200 years ago about an event that took place 500 years ago. Um, so I think there's that. Whether or not Bulgakov knew about MMM, I would say Bulgakov almost 100% certainly never heard about MMM. Um, but the other, the other interesting connection is that the Ivan Vasilievich Minyai Profesio, the the guy die film, apparently they actually use the the costume um, that Nikolai Cherkasov wore in Ivan the Terrible. It's the same same exact costume taken from the Moss film, uh, sort of. Um, I guess, storage facility. Um, so there is a, a literal material connection there. There's, you know, as we speak, I am thinking of more, even if you think of Master of Margarita, you know, Roland at some mm. point insinuates that he's arriving on an invitation, if not in tourist, which might be in tourist by the director mm. of the theater. Mm -hmm. Right, right, right. You know the organization, and then or oh, the professional union, right? And then uh, also the scenes with um, with uh, Maxim Maximovich swallowing the microphone. Mm -hmm. uh, it's in a way, it's also of course very harm scene. In mm -hmm. a bit. Yeah, for but sure. Also, you know the whole uh, theater varieté in Bulgakov, Master and Margarita is also very similar. I wonder mm -hmm. if this, uh, the vibes, the vibes of the thirties, really uh, just that. that yeah. Late motifs, you know. Here we go. I think so. I mean, if we want to think of it as certain channels that that certain types of thinkers could sort of follow, I think that 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 could be the case. Of course, this is really an anomaly in Eisenstein's creative work. You know, he wasn't he wasn't really pursuing these sorts of ideas in his other projects. Though, to your to your sort of uh, first uh, comment about how it's uh, somewhat surprising to hear about so much um, so much humor in Eisenstein, given that his general reputation is for seriousness, I think. This is something that 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 I think um, his legacy has had to deal with. But I think anyone who has spent um, a little bit of time working with his um, his larger theoretical body of work, um, and especially his diaries and stuff, I mean, he, everything was a joke to him. And and there's so much, and I don't mean that in a dismissive way. Even the most awful things, um, and there were plenty of them in his life, you know, were dealt with with some sort of, um, uh, usually some sort of ironical distance. Um, so yeah, I think it's it, it's a shame that he was never really able to pursue fully uh, a comedic film. Um, but you do get the sense that there there was plenty of material for it if he had been in a different context. Yeah, that's that's a new side for me. I, I followed quite a few of his works closely and he always try, strikes me as such a serious, you know, yeah. dead, serious, Marxist, you know, die mm -hmm. hard, no smile, but this whole Bolsheviki also laugh. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, you are talking about uh, 
Eisenstein's visit to Hollywood. Uh, and of course, we know that he was um, influenced as pretty much all early cinema makers by D.W. Griffith and by mm -hmm. Intolerance. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I followed that pretty closely also a few years ago, but it never occurred to me that they could have met. Mm -hmm. So uh, can you talk a little bit, and, and for those, um, again, who are not familiar with the D.W. Griffith, he was one of the most influential filmmakers and um, uh, people, the scholars sometimes refer to him as the creator of the montage uh, and sometimes it's Kulishov and sometimes it's mm -hmm. Eisenstein. So maybe you can uh, comment on that from the more, you know, in-depth position than mine and explain a little bit about their relationship. I think it's complicated and, and I'll say off the top of my head, I don't remember exactly whether or not there was a meeting while they were in Hollywood between, between Griffiths and Eisenstein. Um, it's it's very likely that there could have been, but if there if there was, it would have been a sort of slight one. Um, a lot of the time that Eisenstein spent in Hollywood was under the sort of shadow of um, a sort of uh, what we might call like a witch hunt or a sort of persecution that was being conducted by um, by uh, some sort of far uh, sort of right wing elements in Hollywood who were afraid of the infiltration of uh, communism into, into Hollywood. And um, I think, uh, unfortunately, Griffiths probably was much closer to, to that end of things. Um, however, it is very, you know, possible that they could have met. Um, Eisenstein's diaries are just full of meeting after meeting after meeting with all kinds of people. Um, as to the actual um, uh, influence, definitely um, every, all of the sort of all of the Soviet directors were watching D.W. Griffiths. Everyone was familiar with the techniques that he was innovating. Um, the question of where montage was developed, of course, is a, is a, you know, a debate that, um, that anyone can have and ultimately doesn't really bring you to, to, you know, uh, to a super, um, I think, incisive understanding of what montage is. Um, ultimately, it was a sort of, I would say, group project developed by a number of different directors. Um, and Eisenstein is certainly one of the ones who developed it theoretically much further than, than I would say anyone else ever did. Um, but Eisenstein writes about Griffiths. He has a very interesting um, article that, in which he sort of connects some ideas between Soviet cinema, um, Dickens, and D.W. Griffith. And he sort of, Eisenstein is a really sort of, um, I, I would say a really um, syncretic thinker. He was always, I mean, we're talking about the, uh, the theoretician of montage, but he was always really reaching for what seemed to be incommensurable ideas and bringing them together into sort of a new constellation. Um, and uh, yeah, Griffiths is someone he mentions with some, with some regularity, though never, I would say, with the sort of awe that he usually reserves for, for people like Chaplin, for example. Okay, so here is my question. I will go in in a direction of political realm of 30s. Mm. Uh, Dustin, how mm. would you explain that Eisenstein survived the whole decade? I know that you are, yeah. anybody who thinks about that has to somehow address it. Did he have anybody powerful as his patron saint in it. Uh, how, would, because he was becoming, uh, you mentioned Dovzhenko comment about him. He mm -hmm. was becoming more and more of a formalist. Mm -hmm. He was, which means he was becoming more and more marginalized. Yeah. And, yeah. and of all form of art, the form he chosen was the most connected to propaganda effort For of sure. the party where he the, could, the way he was, he was too big of an artist, too big of a genius, and too big of a sort of world mind to fit mm -hmm. in. So how did he survive? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a great, it's a great question. It's, um, you know, I think to some extent there's, there's a, you know, a degree to which we will never be able to answer those questions about, about, certain figure, you know, for him or, or Pasternak, for example, what, what the actual reality of, of why they survived uh, when others like them didn't. Um, 
but I, I should say that from the time that he returned to the Soviet Union, um, you know, he left in 1929, 1930. Um, and this was at a time when, you know, the, the first five year plan was sort of underway, but had not really become, uh, had not reached its full uh, sort of horrible grandeur. Um, and Stalinism had not yet quite become uh, the sort of um, Stalinism of terror with which we're all familiar. But when he returned in 1932, it had to some extent, right? And he um, unfortunately was somewhat oblivious to that. And you can see that in, in even in the script to MMM, right? He's really sort of sloppy with certain ideological um, sort of, uh, I would say, you know, inaccuracies or sort of tightrope acts that he, if he knew what was really going on in 32, 33, he wouldn't have been messing with it. However, um, I would say, you ask whether he had any sort of patrons from above. I mean, there's a sort of, there's a pretty well documented relationship with Stalin for one thing, um, which was problematic, very problematic, and not too, not too different from, say, Bulgakov's, again, relationship to, to Stalin, in which Stalin knew of, approved of, but also, you know, was was still um, very, very skeptical. Um, and we know that this changes a little bit by the time you get to um, Ivan the Terrible and Alexander Nevsky, uh, where Eisenstein you know, finally sort of succeeds in, in pleasing his, his great um, patron. But in the sort of middle 30s, it, it gets very, very dicey. Um, and Eisenstein has to defend himself over and over again, sometimes very publicly. Sometimes there, there are occasions in which he was forced to write sort of denunciations of his own work, um, you know, sort of self, um, self apologies um, that were, you know, as we know, quite common during, during the 30s. Um, he was close to figures like, say, Mikhail Koltsov who was someone who could have protected him to some extent for some time. And he did some occasionally turn to him for advice. And, and there's one theory that I haven't fully gotten to the end of that it was called Sov who basically told him, stop working on MMM, you're gonna get yourself into trouble. Um, he was also close to Isaac Babel, which means that he was close to, you know, the people that Babel was close to. Um, but eventually that turned into a, a compromising connection, obviously as well by 37, 38. Um, as was his connection to um, Mayer Holt and others. So it's, yeah, it's a complicated question. I think really my, my impression is that he just barely made it uh, on a number of occasions. He probably could have been just like any, um, any of his friends, Bob and Mayer Holt in particular, um, had he not sort of turned in one draft of say the Alexander Nevsky script right when he did, uh, things might've been very different. Um, uh, there was a project that he worked on between 35 and, and 37 called Beijing Luke, which was kind of a, a kind of a, not really, but kind of an adaptation of the Turgenev story um, and the Pavel Marozov legend, not a true story. Um, and this was something that he um, really got himself into trouble with because it was meant to just be a really straightforward ideological sort of um, like raw, raw, raw story, and he wanted to do all these weird things with it. Um, and uh, eventually, yeah, this, this sort of became the, the sort of key crucial breaking point for him, um, and somehow he made it through um, after writing a very, very um, uh, sort of cruel essay about why it was such a horrible idea for him to pursue it in the first place. Um, but yeah, I think this is a question that I, that I want to continue thinking about because it, it, uh, I don't think there's really any way to get to a clear answer, but it is certainly one that will continue to be compelling, especially when we know the fallout that, that surrounded so many others. Dustin, yeah, I'm going back to you. So, um, um, do I understand correctly? Uh, thank you for being such an expert on Eisenstein. There are not many left. Do I understand correctly that he was from Riga, right? He was yes. from Latvia. That yeah. means that he was citizen of different country. Uh, what do um, uh, any, mem any members, any family members of his, did they em emigrate? Did they stay in Latvia? His father, the famous architect? I believe, was, yeah. If I am sort of trying to build um, a point uh, based on analogy, for example, with well-known fact is what's his name, Bulgakov or Babel in his first family, which was in Paris, 
mm -hmm. less known fact uh, about Isaiah Berlin, mm -hmm. who that's the way they escaped because they were citizens of foreign country. Mm -hmm. uh, and he, uh, like for someone being in such a niche place, being citizen of Latvia, which did happen to be free for a while, for that period, uh, you need, you really have to be oblivious. Um, so my question is how his family situation played out? Do you know? Well, yeah, um, I don't uh, have all the facts at my fingertips, but his parents were divorced uh, when he was, um, I think, a, maybe a sort of adolescent, not quite a teenager. Um, and he um, was, for the most part, alienated from his father, who remained in Riga. And he um, maintained uh, his relationship with his mother, who returned to Russia. His mother was Russian. Um, and uh, so eventually his father, who had remained in Riga, I believe, emigrated to Germany and died there, um, if I'm not mistaken, whereas his mother stayed in, in the Soviet Union. Um, so by the time of the revolution, Eisenstein was, had already come back to Russia um, and was sort of just present in time for, for the revolution and to join um, um, uh, the, for the Civil War, and he worked as a, as a military engineer, um, in sort of, um, I believe, near um, like the Divna River, or Divna River, um, sort of near, near uh, ish, the, the frontier um, with the Baltics, but um, for the most part, um, I think, had already situated himself as a, as a Russian with the Latvian in the past. Um, but yes, his father was able, I believe, to, to emigrate before Latvia was sort of conscripted into the larger um, SSR. Dustin? Yeah. Uh, I want to talk about Jewishness of Eisenstein ah. or lack of such. Yeah. Uh, this thing which you presented about even in odd numbers is complete revelation, completely, I mean, out of the blue sort of intimate stuff. Mm -hmm. But thank you for presenting the way he talks about this, the way, the choice of words he's using. Mm -hmm. This will be the way someone who studies Kabbalah talks about mm -hmm. such things. Mm -hmm. But I never knew, from what I know about Eisenstein, I never knew that he was a religious in any form. He was very liberated Jew. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned that his mother returned to Russia. His mother was Ruski. She was not. She was Orthodox. Uh, yeah. She was Ruski Orthodox. Mm -hmm. Uh-huh. So only his father was Jewish. Yeah. Yeah. So his, his affiliation uh, with any kind of Jewishness is very sort of tentative. There are places where he's sort of, you know, in his writing where he seems to sort of identify at the right moment. And you can only imagine that in his friendship with Babil, for example, that must have played a part. Um, but in, in other places, it seems that he completely distances him, himself um, from it. For example, one of his one of his um, one of the proposed projects that he was um, that was recommended to him while he was still in Europe was to make um, an adaptation of the of the Feuchtwanger um, Yudzus um, film, which eventually was made. Right, um, uh, but when he writes about it, it's never with any sort of identification with the subject matter. Um, and no, I would say he was not Jewish, but generally, um, or sorry, I would say he was not religious, but generally he was very interested in, um, in Gnosticism um, and in uh, various types of, um, uh, I guess, sort of um, cosmological systems, which happened to correspond with whatever he was developing for himself as his greater system, right? So he had this sort of um, sort of nomadic um, uh, sort of approach to, to knowledge everywhere. He would sort of pick and choose what was interesting to him. That's why he's interested in, in sort of Eastern philosophy, like the yin and yang stuff that I was mentioning. But also um, he was very interested in, in Christian Gnosticism as well. Um, and um, and uh, so I think that his, his numerology here, for example, I, I'm, I agree with you. I don't know too much about Kabbalistic numerology other than of its existence and a little bit about of its sort of texture. But to me, it seems like it's there as well. What wouldn't surprise me is that it, he w maybe could have been somewhat f familiar with, with uh, Kabbalah, but that he might have really downplayed that um, and, and sort of maybe incorporated it somewhat into what he was thinking and writing without really citing it. 
Gotcha. Uh, we made a lucky acquisition uh, last year, uh, approximately this time, uh, time of year, uh, drawings of Eisenstein. Remember that? In of course. Uh, I was going it, to mention. Yeah. Yes, yes. And it's a fantastic album. And <laughs> he, 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 Eisenstein, is undeniably, uh, how to say it, super talented graphic artist yeah. that uh, he has sure. he has a hand god-given hand and, and he seems to me uh, uh, everywhere i see him he makes his doodles all the time he's mm -hmm. very creative his process doesn't stop i assume Dustin, you spent from your mm, very impressive knowledge of russian I assume you spend time in Moscow, in St. Petersburg, right? Um, did you come across people that ha who have his works in private collections? Like, did it make it, or it's all in archives? Where is all this beautiful stuff? There, um, so there are there are collections that are um, privately held, and I believe there there is one gallery in New York City that has a, a pretty sizable collection of of the drawings. Now, and, and yeah, I believe. There, there are some essays. If you're talking about the, the Thames and Hudson edition that came out maybe three years ago, that big sort of tan colored volume. Yes. Um, in the essay, so that was prepared by Naum Clayman, who's um, sort of the, you know, he was for a long time the head of the um, Moscow Film Museum and um, has sort of run the, the Eisenstein Center in Moscow for a long time and still is sort of at the top of, uh, of our sort of international group of Eisenstein scholars. Um, he has written about um, the sort of fate of a lot of Eisenstein's um, graphic art. But one of the sort of interesting things that relates to what I'm talking about is um, he had a suitcase full of drawings, most of which um, would be considered pornographic, that was confiscated from him while he was crossing the border from Mexico back into the United States in 1932 on his way back eventually to Russia. And so a lot of that is what wound up in this collection in uh, New York, if I'm not mistaken. Um, I know that Naum Clayman has some drawings, um, and um, but I believe that the majority of them are um, still held in the archive um, because they weren't, I mean, he was, he did sort of use them as, uh, give them out as gifts to, to friends, but uh, it was never, I, for him, it was never something that was, his sort of, um, I guess, outward facing artwork. It was something for him that was ultimately a sort of machinery, something that helped him sort of develop his Process. ideas as he was right. working. This right. sort of, um, he writes a lot about just the power of, of the pen in the hand or the pencil and the line and how that sort of opens up the mind um, to sort of, you know, sort of a state of pure expression and so on. And uh, he did not have any family, right? He didn't have wife and children. He married, he married. Married a woman in Para Atasheva, and a lot has been surmised about this. Um, a lot of people sort of assume that it was a marriage of convenience because they didn't truly share space. Um, and most people theorize that that he was not um, heterosexual, right? Though it's unclear what he might have been beyond that. Um, so yeah, it's. Um, he did not have any children and he did not have many people that were very close to him, but he was, he did have a lot of, um, uh, of friends. Um, yeah. May I ask you a personal question? Yeah. What, sure. what brought, I mean, personal in the light of this discussion, mm -hmm. what brought you to Eisenstein? How did you make it there? Um, so I, uh, in graduate school, uh, in the early years of graduate school, I um, was working with a woman named Oksana Bulgakova, who was a visiting professor at Stanford, where I was at the time. Um, and she is, and still is, one of the um, sort of leading Eisenstein scholars. So I sort of came under her um, spell to a certain extent. Um, but I took a lengthy break from academia um, at the end of my 20s and um, maintained my connection with Oksana. And she is someone who has been um, producing um, edited volumes of Eisenstein's theoretical writing um, in Russian and in German. And um, she asked me to do some English translation for it. So I admired and liked Eisenstein, but it wasn't until I started translating his writing that I really became um, deeply interested in what, what he 
did. And for me, always what's been far more interesting than his films is his uh, sort of conceptual world that he inhabits, which is just seemingly endless um, with, its, with its references and its um, sort of um, processes. Um, so I, I edited a couple of, um, of volumes of, of his, or sorry, I translated a couple of his volumes into English and then from there sort of re-entered academia and, and developed projects. And while I was translating those, um, those uh, longer texts, um, it was really his writing about these unfinished projects that, that really caught my ear, partially because uh, at the time also, um, I was mostly working as a, as a photographer. Um, in New York City and was acutely aware of the difficulty of completing um, projects in, in a really thorough way. And it was really, um, really sort of um, focused on the idea of process as more important than conclusion. Um, so this is one of those things that sort of stood out to me as a sort of um, beacon in another world that, um, that I could hold on to personally. Right. Well, thank you so much. Thank you for excellent questions, Boris, and for equally excellent answers. That yeah, thank you, Boris. Fascinating. Thank you, guys. We actually have um, um, our um, one of our constant visitors and uh, uh, audience members, Matthew Solomon, says he's speechless and wow. So he doesn't have a question per se, but he would like to see uh, what is that album that we have mentioned that Boris now has in his possession. It's a fantastic book. We had several albums mm -hmm. and they sold very quickly and I actually should reorder. We, uh, to mention to our audience, we offer quite a few books in English and in Russian on Eisenstein, on uh, his uh, memoirs, immortal memoirs and uh, in English. Uh, and we have several books on uh, Eisenstein. And uh, Dustin, do you have a book on Eisenstein? Well, so my, my book on the unfinished projects is, is nearing completion and, I, and um, will be complete as of uh, this fall. And then, you know, the, the publishing process, um, you know, question mark. Um, but the, the books that I was um, referring to, um, the, the ones that were edited by Oksana Bulgakova that I translated, they are available for, for purchase and I can... I can. I've seen several books uh, by you from that publisher and uh, we will make sure that Globus offers um, these titles because we carry the titles by the authors that we present on our YouTube channel. So I'll make sure that we have those. I'm sure our our audience would love to. I know I would. I didn't have a chance yet. So um, uh, it's the definite wow. And what what a width and depth of, of your scope of um, exploration of Russian culture. I know you also translated Tolstoy and from Tolstoy to Eisenstein. It's, it's fantastic. And uh, I'm so glad that we, we are able to bring this knowledge and share it with with our audience uh, and I know I have gazillion other questions but I will hold on on them because I think once you have a book maybe we can have you back and you can speak of the other projects yeah I'd love to that would be great that that would be terrific uh, I I think we were about to uh, perhaps end it and I will pass the mic to Dustin for the final, you know, for the conclusion and final word on it. But I also wanted to mention something that comes to my mind, um, and that that's with in connection with Eisenstein's most known work, which is, of course, Battleship Potemkin, which to me, it was coming to my mind recently a lot, uh, like during the last few months of um, current political situation in Russia, because I think Eisenstein was creating Tipaji, but he created the archetype of this suppressing totalitarian machine. And even the slogan, you know, when you read Adin uh, Zavsiach, you say that Navo, like one for all and mm -hmm. all for everything, that's the same slogan that is still. Uh, being used and is still out there. And there, there is, of course, so much that is, in his words, immortal and 
stays there. The, the, the good things and the bad things, and hopefully the bad things eventually will be gone and the good archetypes will stay with us, but that remains to be seen. And with that, uh, thank you, Dustin. And is there any wisdom you wanna share with our audience uh, in the conclusion? Well, I don't, yeah, I don't know if I have any wisdom to share, but I, I can say thank you very much for, for having me um, and uh, for, the, for your questions and for Boris's questions. I mean, these are, these are things, you know, it's probably obvious. It's a topic that I love thinking about and, and talking about. And it's always wonderful to hear the immediate response from, from people who, um, who come up with, you know, a sort of aspect of it that, um, that I hadn't yet gotten to. So thank you for that. And, and I look forward to, to the future chatting like this. Big thanks, Dustin. Good job and gives lots of material for discussion for tonight's dinner for Andrew. <laughs> Thank you. We, we all will make this dinner much more meaningful. Yeah. Thank you, Thank you Thank Boris. You. We actually have been taught that uh, Globus programs are uh, like the dinner you want to have with your friends, but the dinner has been cancelled. I also like to think about it. I'm always inspired by Serge Dagilev and his Russian seasons. And his main philosophy was to bring talent to people and let them do what they do the best of what they want to do. And that's pretty much what we do. We invite interesting people. And it always ends up with some firework on new knowledge, ideas, and sparkles. And I hope that was like this to you tonight. Have a great dinner, bon appetit, and uh, tune in, uh, subscribe. The last thing I will say, subscribe for our channel. We're bringing in a lot of interesting things, kind of in the vein of today with the MMM uh, comedy. There will be a great talk by Mark Lipovetsky, who is a leading uh, expert on um, Soviet literature. Uh, uh, the talk is uh, Soviet trickster. Why do we love them? And why do we hate post-Soviet tricksters? And Mark is so funny and brilliant. And I really recommend to tune in. We do have a show on harms and uh, Marian Goff. That was fantastic too by translator Alexander Segal and uh, Marin Goff's work is not published. So that's probably your only chance to hear uh, bits and pieces in English. And just check out our archives on YouTube. You'll see a lot of interesting things. Come join us. If you have a great idea, reach out. I'm always looking for something that is not covered yet or covered from a different angle. And with that being said, stay safe, stay well, and we'll see you soon. Thank you very much, Dustin and Boris and the audience. Bye.